For my senior project, I chose to write a novel, and I'd like to open by reading the first chapter. On Monday morning, first day of school, I walked to the bus stop, ticket in hand, prepared for my new ride. My mom usually gave me a ride, but we had fallen on hard times, and I was forced to take public transportation. The bus was late, and I almost thought of making the long trek to school on foot when it finally appeared. Looming and slightly leaning to the right, with paint that might once have been white, but that was now very much a muddy gray, it pulled up to the sidewalk so abruptly that I thought for a moment it wouldn't stop and instead would go careening into me, shattering the glass panels of the bus stop like some action scene in a B-grade superhero movie. It did stop, though, in a cloud of exhaust, brakes still screeching as the door swung open haphazardly. I boarded gingerly. In my haste, I tripped on a step but caught myself quickly handing the driver the ticket and finding a seat. Cool, smell, chill, smooth. The bus was practically empty. This fact came with pros and cons. Pros, fewer people to deal with. Cons, fewer crowds to disappear into, more chances for strange eye contact with randos. In my hurry to sit, I had sat right across from an old man. It was very awkward trying to avoid the fact that he was in my immediate sight line, but I was stuck to that seat sure of the fact that moving would draw even more attention to myself. I couldn't help but notice the man. He sat upright poised, his back completely straight, probably the way we all ought to sit, although few of us do. He had thick white hair that would have been translucent were it not for the sheer volume of it. His features were aquiline, and, and although he had wrinkles framing his eyes and mouth, there was a polished, smooth quality to his skin. <laughs> his legs were long. With both feet on the ground, his knees rose above the level of his hips. I held out on eye contact for as long as I could, but eventually, aided by an unexpected bump caused by the bus hitting a pothole, our eyes met. Things were startlingly sharp, like two finely polished gems, under eyebrows so pale they almost seemed blue. I looked away, not wanting to engage in any conversation with any crazy old man, even an oddly dignified looking one. To distract myself, I practiced my piece. I played piano for many years, and it was a habit of mine, when I was in an awkward or boring situation, to tap out my piece with my fingers using any available surface as my keyboard. It's the same principle as the classic air guitar, just less attention drawn. So when I say I practiced my piece on the bus, I really mean to say I tapped my fingers on my knees for the duration of the trip. When my stop came, I hoisted my backpack and stood up to leave. As I was doing so, the old man looked up at me. Chopin? He asked in a voice that was worn but precise. Watson, let's see. He thought for a moment. C minor? He was right. That was the piece I had had in mind. I stopped in my track, strangely embarrassed. It felt like he had just quoted a passage from my diary, decoded a secret language I thought nobody else knew but me. Uh, yeah, actually, I muttered, figuring the man deserved a reply just for guessing correctly however he did it. I walked down the aisle and out the door before he could respond. Writing a novel. I knew I wanted to write a novel um, from the moment senior projects were discussed, but I didn't really know how I would go about doing it. Before I really started this project, I thought that to write a novel, you had an idea, you just scribbled it all down, and Boom, you're published, you're the next day. <laughs> but um, I tried that. That was my first idea, and I got to about two pages. So it didn't really work out. And I realized that writing a novel actually takes a lot more planning. So the first thing that I needed for my novel was a plot. And the way I chose my plot was I wrote some log lines, which are basically a one-sentence overview of a story. So I had, maybe I would write a collection of essays. Maybe I would write about a girl who keeps waking up at the beginning of the same month. Maybe I would write about a girl who enters a music competition. Maybe I would write about someone who writes other people's love letters for them. Or I could write about a boy discovering a wizarding world after growing up in a cu cupboard under the staircase. <laughs> I don't know, that would probably not sound. <laughs> I decided to go so the log line I chose was when her family falls on hard times, a high school junior enters a music competition to win a college scholarship, but ends up learning there are different definitions of success. So, I had my plot. Now I needed to have some major stepping stones along the way so I could really figure out what would be happening 
between the beginning and the end. So I had some major points that I put together, and then I had to go and make an in-depth outline. And that outline basically was each scene that I was going to write about, and all the actions that happened in the scene, and the characters' reactions for every different scene in the book. For example, with this first chapter, I have my girl, Harper Wolf. She gets on the bus, she's tapping her piece, man guesses her song, she leaves the bus. And I did this with the whole story. And it took me quite a few outlines until I was happy with the one that I had. But even after I started writing, it ended up changing a lot. This is a picture of the first day when I had my outline, and then this is after I really got to writing it. Once I had my outline, it was just time to write. With writing, there's not really a lot you can do to get better except just writing. If you want to be a doctor, you don't just start practicing surgery to be a good surgeon. But with writing, you really just start writing to be a better writer. And some days it felt very manageable, and others I felt... <laughs> 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 Every morning I would go to the Bulldog, which was kind of my office, and I would write for an hour with my dad in the morning before I went to school, and I would try to write around 500 or 1,000 words just to keep myself on track. And I set myself a couple longer word goals because when you're looking at the screen, even if the number says that you've written like 27 pages, it still feels like you're just on one page. So that was pretty helpful for me. A lot of the decisions along the way I hadn't even thought I would have to consider. I had to pick a tense, I had to pick <laughs> to speak in first person or second person, third person. I had to figure out the school. For me, figuring out the school is one of the harder things because going to a small school, I wanted to have my character go to a public school and I wasn't sure if I would be able to write about that realistically going here. But I was able to talk to some of my friends who went to public school and they helped me out. Uh, another challenge with writing something so long is that I had to really make my characters seem realistic and they couldn't be too eccentric or have strange habits or else I wouldn't be able to carry that through the whole book. But I would always kind of want to write these weird characters because I'd only ever written like comedy sketches or short stories. So to help me with this, I would kind of slip in a couple characters that wouldn't be in the book for long periods of time but that I could sort of make a little bit crazy. So for the next chapter, I'm going to read. It's an example of that. Um, all you really need to know is that my character is in her high school, and she has to meet with a guidance counselor. This chapter is called Mr. Sherrod. As part of the college prep aspect of my high school, each high school junior and senior was required to meet with one of two guidance counselors to ensure we would be prepared to apply for college. The two options were Miss Williams and Mr. Sherrod. The former was a kindly elderly woman who offered every student a cup of tea or hot chocolate upon entering, and would meet with the student for however long it took for them to work their problem out. Mr. Sherrod, on the other hand, looked like he had walked straight out of Woodstock. He had long blonde hair and a wiry beard. He wore a suit, but instead of it having the effect of making him look orderly and in charge, it only highlighted the disarray. He looked like a hobo who had just escaped from the streets after knocking out a businessman and stealing his clothes. <laughs> I got assigned with Mr. Sherrod. Just my luck. And I had to meet with him during my only free period. Brilliant. Harper, Harper, Harper. Sit, sit, sit. I would come to learn that Mr. Sherrod liked to repeat words. Call me Wyatt. He ushered me into his office, a perfumed room with one desk with a wooden chair on one side and an oversized beanie bag on the other. <laughs> Above the desk was a large poster with a rainbow and a dolphin on it that read, Study like you just don't care. He sat on the chair and gestured for me to sit on the beanie bag. I would be discussing the important topic of my future from the undignified perch of a tie-dyed staff on the floor. Although beanie bags looked comfortable, I felt like I was sitting directly on the ground. Every time I tried to sit up straight, I managed to sink lower into it. Mr. Sharag opened up a drawer from his desk and pulled out a slim file. So, Harper Wolf, what a great last name. He sifted through the file. GPA, 3.4. Mm-mm-mm, 3.4, that's not too good, is it? I couldn't tell if that was a question or a statement. I didn't answer. I was starting to wish the beanie bag would swallow me whole. Extracurriculars? 
He paused and looked up at me. Well, I cleared my throat. Well, I play piano. Sports? Uh, no. Chess, debate, anything slightly academic in the least? <coughs> uh, no, I mean some music theory that has some math in it, I guess. He chuckled to himself, some math. Then to me mockingly, one, two, three, four, besides counting, hon. He stacked the papers. Do you care about your future? I nodded. Good, so you really need to start acting like you do. I was confused. What do you mean? He leaned closer to me. He smelled like incense. Well, for one thing, music is nice and all, but you need to be doing some actual stuff that will be useful in real life. I didn't know what to say. How can you explain something to someone who has no desire to hear it? And beyond that, how do you make clear the importance of something that is not necessarily essential to daily life? How do you explain art to a moron? Uh, well, I'm in a competition. I could get a scholarship to Juilliard. I sounded ridiculous and insecure, as though I did not believe what I was saying, which was partially true. Mr. Chirag chuckled. Kid, let me give you a piece of advice. Dreaming big is great, but don't dream so big that your dream is a joke. He sucked in a breath so deep that his beard trembled. Then he let the air out with a whistle. Juilliard! He burst into laughter, flat shoulders shaking under the ill-fitting suit. I suggest that you start looking at some other options. You know, not Juilliard. <laughs> he turned to his computer and typed something in. I noticed a large, ugly mole on his neck. I, mole on his neck. I bet he just grew the beard to cover the mole. Here, let me show you some things that might be plausible for you to do. Alba called out to his assistant, a homely woman wearing a coral pink cardigan and nails of the same color sitting in an office adjacent to his. Alba, get me the paper I just printed. I'd never seen a hippie inspire so much nervous energy in someone. Alba rushed in and set down the paper on his desk. Mr. Chirag did not thank her. Here, take a look at this, okay? He handed me the paper. It had a list of all the available clubs in the school. None of them looked appealing. Mr. Chirag, I protested. Call me Wyatt. I pretended not to hear. These clubs sound cool if I were interested in chess or lacrosse or gender studies or politics, but I'm not really. He looked annoyed. Thing is, art is great, you know. But what job do you expect, do you expect to get knowing some music theory? A teacher? Have fun getting almost zero pay and trying to live with dignity, am I right? He tapped the list. Think about it. One of the most rewarding parts of um, writing this novel was getting it finally printed out and holding it as a manuscript because I've always dreamed of getting a large stack of papers that is all my writing. And so I went to Kinko's and I got a manuscript that was really cool. Uh, something that I really appreciate about writing and I think part of why I'm drawn to do it is that if something happens to you in life that's bad, you don't really have that much control over it. But if you write about it, then you have this way to make it your own story, even if it was a bad experience or humiliating. Or if you hear something funny, you have a way to bring it in and share it with people by writing about it. So I kind of learned that everything is copy. And although a lot of my novel is fiction and it doesn't really have anything to do with my real life, I was able to take a lot of influences from things I've heard people say or do. Um, another challenge, though, of writing my novel was that I had to really focus on the story. And so I could only think about these characters which was kind of frustrating because I'd often get ideas for other things that I really wanted to write about and wouldn't be able to. Um, one of these ideas I had was for a movie, and I really wanted to write the script for a movie, but I knew that I couldn't just veer off my project and start writing that. So I thought I, I kind of wove it into my other parts of my writing. And um, if you can see here, some titles of maybe books I'll write in the future. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Kale, You're in Here, You're Not. <laughs> maybe after this. So I'd just like to read one last thing to close. It's a part of a chapter called Stinger. And all you really need to know is that my character is kind of into the getting ready for her competition. She got asked out on a date, and um, she accepted, and She's at the movie theater with her date. It's called Stinger. The movie was called The Fallback Guy. It was about this man, Stephen Dent, who is the understudy for a secret agent. 
It was funny, but had action. Perfect for a date. But halfway through, I started to think about the competition, zoning in and out of the movie for about 20 minutes. My hand started tapping, almost as if it had a life of its own. I played the piece over and over again on the side of my chair. Then, before I could even realize what had happened, my hand was being held by someone. Owen, of course. Although, for a moment, I had forgotten I was with him and thought that some <coughs> random theater pervert had grabbed me. <laughs> he leaned a little closer and whispered, I know that you're probably thinking of, I know what you're probably thinking about right now, but there's nothing you can do about it, so maybe you don't think it? He said this with a grin, as if he knew that asking me not to think about the competition was a ridiculous request. But he kept holding my hand and squeezed it slightly to punctuate his question. Okay. I was frozen. Nobody had held my hand since my grandmother had taken me to the Bronx Zoo in fifth grade. <laughs> if Owen's words didn't serve as comfort, his holding my hand shocked me enough so that the horrible earworm that my song had become to me was zapped out of my mind. Although the song had left my head, I was unable to focus on the movie, because now I was thinking about his hand. I was so aware of it. It was like all of a sudden my hand was a thousand times more sensitive. Our hand sat still in the divider of the two seats. It was awesome, but at the same time I was terrified that my hand would get super sweaty and would slide out of his by just the sheer slipperiness. When the credits rolled, the good guy won, but his therapist and all-around mother figure died. I stood up and stretched my arms above me, but Owen grabbed my hand and pulled me back down to my seat. You have to see the stinger. The what? The post credit scene. Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. I guess there are two types of people in this world, those who stay for the stinger and those who do not. He was right. After the credits roll, there was an extra scene. Our hero, Stephen Dent, stood at the door of his recently expired therapist's office. He rang the bell and a beautiful woman opened the door. She explained that she was the therapist's daughter. Their eyes met and he smiled. <laughs> Worth the wait? Sure, why not? If you're going to see a movie, it's nice to leave a little hopeful. Owen turned to me, frowning slightly. Harper, there's something we are probably really <coughs> thinking about right now. Something that could possibly occur between us later, possibly when you are leaving the car tonight. I could feel my face getting hot. I was glad that the theater was still dark. He leaned forward. His breath smelled like junior mints. So, is it possible we could get it over with now? Just so we won't be thinking and wondering about it the whole night? <laughs> so we won't be thinking about what? I asked. <laughs> I was pretty sure I knew what he was talking about, but I didn't want to say kiss and have him say exchanging snapshots. <laughs> you know, he leaned even closer. The kiss. Okay, I think that would be fine. <laughs> Close my eyes. I didn't know what to do, how to brace myself. How does one even begin a kiss? I worried it would be awkward. What if we missed each other's mouths? <laughs> what if I somehow bit him or something? It wasn't awkward. I didn't bite him. We didn't miss each other's mouths. As to knowing what to do, it just worked. Maybe hum humans have something in them that programs them to just know how to kiss. Like how spiders are programmed to make webs. Sorry, maybe I shouldn't mention spiders when I'm trying to tell you about something romantic. <laughs> it lasted a couple of seconds, then I noticed that the movie cleanup crew had entered the theater. Owen leaned away, breaking the kiss. We better go. We have a dinner to get to. Best stinger ever. <laughs>